Let us worship God. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. The Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Let's stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now as, as uh, your children, saved by your grace. We uh, acknowledge that uh, we only can come to you through Jesus Christ, and we, we look to him as uh, our only hope, and we look to him as uh, the Lord of our salvation and the Lord uh, of heaven and earth, and we, we praise your goodnesses to us. We thank you that you have made us part of your kingdom and that you have given us a role in it. And we pray that you'd lead us into greater obedience by the power of your spirit yes, within Lord. us. Um, make us bigger, more and more aware of this big picture that we have of, of who we are and our eternal hope. And we ask that you would uh, comfort us in our needs. We pray that you would sustain us through our daily uh, activities and help us not to be uh, so overwhelmed with our daily activities and the concerns and, and uh, the aggravations of life that we lose sight of the big picture of, of serving you in word and thought and deed. We thank you that your kingdom is growing in many parts of the world. We thank you that your church is, is vibrant and we know that your spirit would lead it into ever greater faithfulness. And we pray for the greater faithfulness of the church in the West. We pray for its revival. We know that you can change men and nations and civilizations when uh, it's in your providential will, and we long to see that time. We long to see you glorified, and uh, we long to see uh, uh, evil replaced with righteousness by the power of your spirit. Thank you. Encourage us, we pray, in our walk of faith. Encourage us as a, as a community of faith uh, locally, and uh, give us the joy of your salvation. We pray now that you would accept our words of praise and may the words spoken be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 608. Hymn 608. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. 608.
Psalter selection this morning is Psalter selection number 41, found on page 638. Psalter selection 41, found on page 638. Bow down thine ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. Thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice, the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there in any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things, thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud have risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before thee. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thy handmaid. Show me uh, a token for good, that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast helped me and comforted me. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to show them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And in Zion shall be said, This and that man was born in the earth. And my eyes himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. As well as the singers and the players on instruments shall be there. All my strings are in thee. Let's now join and uh, recite together uh, the Nicene Creed, which is the front of our Psalter booklets. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of the very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Our scripture this morning is Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 32, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Mark 10, 32 through 52. And our subject is greatness in the kingdom. Mark 10, beginning at verse 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them, unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and they shall scourge him, and they shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and, and the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall ask, we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto him, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And we heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. In verses 32 to 34, Jesus speaks to the disciples of his death and resurrection. All three of the synoptic gospels note this. All three quote Jesus as saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Our text notes that just before this, the disciples were amazed and afraid. They knew that going to Jerusalem with the other Passover pilgrims, and the roads were likely you know, crowded with them, was dangerous because they knew of the death plots against Jerusalem. Jesus. Jesus was walking ahead of the twelve. They were in the way, that is, on the road. There would have been many other pilgrims going to Jerusalem. It's not clear if Jesus was walking ahead of the disciples because he with, was with a crowd of others who wanted to speak with them, uh, or whether Jesus was alone. Part of the reason they were afraid and amazed was some of the things Jesus had been saying 
of length. And they were trying to correlate their meaning. The twelve didn't understand what Jesus meant about his death and resurrection when he said it to them. Luke, at least Luke particularly notes that of the three synoptic gospels. Then we have following that the incident with James and John. It's entirely possible that James and John may have been trying to change the subject to one they did understand, they thought they understood, and one that was more positive. That why was Jesus, after talking about the kingdom and all these positive things about entering his kingdom, now suddenly talking about death and dying? You recall when Peter, much earlier, had admonished uh, Jesus for speaking in such negative terms, Jesus very quickly condemned him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now Jesus takes a, makes a point of taking the twelve aside and speaking to them. And we're told what he spoke to them of. He said what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And it's very clear in the Gospels what he was saying. It's not entirely clear whether it was clear to the disciples or they. this is a later commentary on what Jesus said. And they said, now we understand that this is what he was talking about at the time. It's hard for us to understand, given the limited information we have in the Gospels, of the disciples' lack of understanding at times. What is clear uh, from the words of James and John is that they definitely believed in the kingdom, at least as they understood it. They didn't fully understand the kingdom, but they... Uh, to the extent that they understood it, they believed it. Because Jesus has been speaking of the kingdom for three years. Now, of late, he's talking about his death and his mistreatment. But then he's talking about rising again. Some here have suggested that the disciples, uh, I don't like the word figuratively because that implies all kinds of bad things about theology when people take things figuratively. But perhaps they thought it was a parable or an illustration of his rejection and that his rising again would be the revival of his kingdom after a setback. And so they went back to something that was familiar to them. Well, we're not sure what he means by this negative talk, but we believe in the kingdom. He's been talking about the kingdom for three years, so we're going to stick with the subject of the kingdom. Uh, Edersheim thinks that what we have in the gospel is, is likely the later understanding of the disciples um, when they wrote the gospels and then they now they, they fully understood what Jesus was referring to. They really amplify it and it was not at all clear to them at the time. Something that's even more confusing perhaps to us <coughs> is the better understanding of those who put guards at the tomb because they had an understanding that Jesus had spoken of rising again. Perhaps that was an advantage the religious leaders had in academically understanding the implications of atonement. That if Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, perhaps they understood something of, of what he was saying in the context of theology and the disciples really didn't understand that he was referring to himself as, as the Lamb of God at this time. Perhaps the best assumption, or the safest assumption, minimally, is that the disciples could not reconcile the death of Jesus and the certainty of the kingdom. And so they fell back on wanting to talk to Jesus about the kingdom and the, uh, their role in the kingdom. After all, he had been talking about that for three years and only of late talking about his death and resurrection. What's clear here is that Jesus had a clear understanding of what was going to happen. Christ's death was not a backup plan, as per Schofield's uh, dispensational view. Schofield uh, made the first uh, study Bible. He put he published the King James Version of the Bible, but he added a lot of uh, 
a notes to it as footnotes. And he explained a lot of things, and his eschatology was very dispensational. And he said that the, he claimed that the, Jesus wanted to set up his kingdom uh, on earth, but that he was rejected. And therefore, because he was rejected, he had to go to a backup plan, and that is his atonement. And that the entire church age was completely unforeseen before that, never predicted in any prophecy in the Old Testament, when they've got that right, and that it was just inserted as a parenthesis because the kingdom was put on hold until Jesus comes back again and then he does it, that he actually sets up his kingdom. Um, well, that's dispensationalism. And the next discussion of Jesus is going to be that he has come to minister. That was his plan. Jesus said, determined to go to Jerusalem, and he's telling the disciples that that is his, what he is going to do, and that his job is to give his life a ransom for many. That is how he serves the Father. The disciples believed in Jesus, and they followed him, even when they did not understand his word, how his words were play, going to play out. It's been noted that uh, every eschatological scheme, that is, every scheme of the last things uh, in the first century was wrong. The disciples were wrong on their eschatology. They thought the kingdom would have a, some sort of a political, geographic connotation and that Jesus was going to, to set it up. But if their incorrect an understanding of eschatology led to poor understanding of uh, their current responsibilities. And that's what leads to this request of James and John. Jesus, later on the night of his arrest, would tell the disciples that it was necessary that he would, should go away so that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would come. Okay, now we come to the request of, of James and John. Matthew says their, their mother... Uh, the wife of Zebedee, who is believed to be Salome, made the request as well. What's very evident again, both in the mother of James and John and in James and John, is their definite belief in the certainty of the kingdom that Jesus had been preaching. John, before Jesus had preached the kingdom, uh, that it was <coughs> imminent, Jesus then preached the kingdom. The gospel accounts are full of the kingdom of heaven. They're so full of it that dispensationalism had to find a way to postpone it, to get around it. They say, well, where the kingdom was temporarily, but then it's been suspended by the church age, which is a big parenthesis, and when Jesus comes back physically, he'll set up the kingdom, and then the kingdom will resume. Um, the result, of course, of dispensationalism, because dispensationalism divides the Bible up into different historical eras, and God that has had a different plan for each one, it means that much of Scripture doesn't apply to us today. It's for a different historical context and a different plan. And even though there's some consistency in, in the plan, much of Scripture, even though historically said to be accurate, no longer applies in this parentheses they call the church age. So the Old Testament no longer applies, and depending on the version of dispensationalism, only certain parts of the New Testament applies. Even the Gospels are said to not technically apply because Jesus was preaching the kingdom and the kingdom's been suspended during the church age. In fact, some dispensationalists will not say the Lord's Prayer because it says thy kingdom come and the kingdom has been suspended. So that's not going to happen for, for some time. The extreme form of dispensationalism said that the, um, the church age didn't even happen until late in Acts, so that only certain of the epistles actually are for the church age. Once you get into deciding what parts of scripture apply, you get into very dangerous ground. Well, the disciples believed in the kingdom, and they, they had heard Jesus preach the kingdom so much that 
they had to defer to that belief in the kingdom that Jesus had spoken of so many times when they didn't understand his words about death and resurrection. So they go to that certainty, and they ask Jesus about something about the uh, kingdom. James and John have been raked over the coals for this request. One commentator said, uh, now we come to this embarrassing question by James and John. Uh, you know, we cringe to hear them make this request because the assumption is this is a purely selfish thing. They just wanted some honor and glory for themselves and uh, uh, it's a, it was a shameful episode amongst the disciples. Jesus only told them that they didn't understand what they were asking. He, Jesus never criticized them for, for, for asking. <laughs> when the ten objected, it was only when they objected in anger, directed at James and John, that Jesus spoke somewhat more harshly, because they all misunderstood. It's easy to read this and think James and John were asking for special privilege. <coughs> they were asking for honors and prestige for themselves. James and John wanted to be elevated above all others. They did want a position. <coughs> they did want a prominent position, but we have to ask what position were they asking for, and why did they want it? What did that position even entail? To be seated at the throne of a king was a position of office, not just honor. It was an important position. It would be most comparable in the Bible to the position of Joseph being the number two man in the kingdom. And what do we have about the role of Joseph? He was in charge of a great deal. And he had tremendous authority, but he was definitely, and it's repeated multiple times, he was number two uh, to Pharaoh. We see Joseph working for Pharaoh on behalf of Pharaoh. To be seated on the throne was to be a minister of the one on the throne. It was to work for him and to do his bidding. It was to bring him information. It was to issue his decrees to see that they were enforced. In more, somewhat more modern times, it would be comparable to in a monarchy. We don't have many monarchies left. A prime minister to a king. Or in our form of government, like a chief of staff to a president. If you wanted access to the president, you had to go through the chief of staff. If the president ordered something done, the chief of staff was responsible for the uh, details of making sure that that order was complied with. James and John were not just asking for prestige, they were asking for jobs with major responsibilities. They wanted to be leaders in the kingdom. That's why Jesus wasn't harsh with them. He said, you know what? You don't understand. They didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. James and John believed in the kingdom, and they wanted to have positions of trust and responsibilities. When they say, said, grant us, they were saying, we, we want this job. You see, it's like whenever a new administration, uh, whether it's a you know, governor or uh, a president, there are people lined up applying for jobs particularly the people who really believe in this politician. Um, some years ago, you recall, California had a governor named uh, George Dukmajian. He was an Armenian. And when, as soon as he uh, became governor, or shortly be there before, a lot of the positions that he was appointed were being announced. And there were a few prominent Armenians being appointed by this Armenian governor. And somebody once asked my dad, says, how does it feel to be the only Armenian in California not appointed to a statewide job? Um, but people wanted jobs in the administration. And they wanted, because they want in on the action. James and John were saying, we want in on the action of your kingdom. 
We want to have an important role in it. They were offering to work for the kingdom, not just prestige. They were asking because they believed in the kingdom. The only criticism of James and John by Jesus is that they had no idea what they were really asking for. In reality, they were already <laughs> slated for such a role. Last week, we looked at the account of the rich young ruler. And Matthew quoted Jesus as saying something about the disciples' future. This has just happened. And this may have precipitated the request of James and John. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He said that was a reference to, when was Jesus on the throne of his glory? It's when he ascended into heaven, he sat at the right hand, and the Father said, sit, quoting Psalm 110, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus says, when that happens, you're going to be, on the 12 thrones of Israel. They, again, they, the disciples probably didn't fully understand what that meant. But that probably precipitated this question by James and John. Jesus said, we're going to sit on 12 thrones. Give me a prominent role. We want a, an important job in this kingdom that you're talking about. James and John were saying, yes, this is what, what you said is what we desire. The request was based on his prophecy in effect even if they didn't fully understand the prophecy they believed in the victory of the kingdom but they couldn't reconcile that to the words of his death so Jesus asked if they could drink of the cup from which he drank or be baptized with the baptism that he was to be baptized with again without really understanding they promised that they could. Again, they didn't understand what he was talking about. They were very eager, even if they didn't understand. The cup is most easily understood in terms of what Jesus said at the Last Supper. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament means the new covenant, the renewed covenant. Because Jesus made the covenant full because he was the actual atonement. He just... He wasn't like a, 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 the blood of you know, goats or bulls that didn't really atone. He was the actual atonement. So this cup represents my blood, which is the new covenant, the renewed covenant in my blood. The baptism Jesus referred to was also his death. Now, Jesus had been baptized by water with John. Baptism was a sign of the covenant. And to violate the covenant involved penalties. And so, Jesus was baptized with water to fulfill all righteousness. But a sign, the sign of the covenant was a pledge to the covenant. And the violation of the covenant involved its penalty. Jesus assumed the penalties of the violation of the, co of the covenant. In water baptism, Jesus was submitting himself to the covenant terms in anticipation of his assuming its penalty. So both the cup that Jesus referred to and his baptism were references to his atoning death. Again, James and John didn't understand any of this until later, obviously. But just as they hadn't understand his, his earlier reference, specific reference to his death in Jerusalem. They may have assumed that his death was a setback, a parable regarding something bad that was going to happen in Jerusalem, but his rising again would be a revival and hopefully the institution of the kingdom that they, as they understood it. But they did believe in the kingdom, so... They focused on what they did believe in, certainly, and they did understand, even if they didn't really under, weren't at all clear on the manifestation of the kingdom. And we're still not entirely clear on the manifestation of the kingdom. We look around us and we say, the world can't be filled with godliness. How is that ever going to happen? We don't even look at the progress the kingdom has made. 
in the last 2,000 years. Uh, we're at a low point in the church in the West right now. Um, but in many parts of the world, they're optimistic about the kingdom because the church is growing there. And we figure, we, we sometimes give too much credit to evil men. God can change men. I mean, just like Paul, God can change changed him when he wanted him. God can, can change men. He can change nations. He, and we're told that that will eventually happen. Jesus did not correct the misunderstanding of James and John. He only told them one more thing that they would not understand until later. And something that we have to remember is that we're amazed at the slow learning curve of the disciples, but it's all laid out for us for purpose. It's to accelerate our own. I mean, they had all the trouble. They struggled with this whole idea of, of death and rising again. We get that. I mean, from the time we're young, we've, we've seen crucifixes. We know what that represents. Even if we don't like the use of crucifixes, we know what it represents. We see a cross in front of a Protestant church. We know what that's a reference to. And so we have this much shorter learning curve for us because of the slow one in this recorded in Scripture of the disciples. Jesus said, you're going to drink of this cup. You will share in it. That's what we claim in the Lord's Supper. That his body is sacrificed for us. His blood is shed for us. We acknowledge that cup of the New Testament in Christ's blood when we drink the wine. We acknowledge his, uh, the, the bread represents his shed, uh, his uh, body slain for us. We say that this is part of who we are when we consume them. We say that we are the atoned, we are the redeemed by Christ's blood. Jesus said, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized withal shall ye be baptized. The correction of Jesus uh, the, uh, to James and John comes in verse 40. He said, But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Now, if you notice in uh, the King James Version, um, it shall be given to them is in italics, means it's inserted for clarity. J. Green's literal translation renders that, but to sit off my right and off my left is not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. Sounds similar. The King James added the words for clarity, but those words can be misconstrued because it shall be given to them, can be contrasted with it's not mine to give, as though Jesus has no say in these things Whatsoever, And that's not what the King James translators were trying to imply. It's not what the Greek is implying. Jesus, as the triune God, does have a part in this. The point is that their roles have already been prepared for them. So it's not something that Jesus, at this late date, was, already, was, was going to decide uh, for them. It was already decided. God does answer his prayer prayers. Uh, God does not answer prayers outside of his providence. Jesus was putting their futures in the larger context of a plan that was prepared for them. The other ten then objected. They were much displeased with James and John. Matthew says they were moved with indignation. They were angry. Why they were angry has to do with what James and John asked for. And it was the anger of the ten that precipitates Christ's words of warning that none of them understood. James and John didn't understand, and the ten that were objecting didn't understand. So Jesus says in, in verses 42 through 45, he said, 
Uh, ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But it shall, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The model of of the kingdom they had was wrong, and the model of their role in it was therefore wrong. The old Hebrew monarchy was a human administration. That model was the one that was common throughout the world. If you recall, the people that asked for a human king, and God gave it, it to them. That was the only model the Gentiles knew. It was also the model of the religious leaders to have power and authority over the people. The kingdom of God needed shepherds who served the sheep, not administrators. The ministry of Jesus on earth was one of service, of ministry, and of giving his life a ransom for many. So the leadership that was prepared for James, John, and, and the ten did involve authority, but it was primarily one of serving others. It would not look like a king's right-hand man. It would not look like the role of a prime minister. What's very clear here is, is that the disciples definitely believed in the kingdom. And I think all 12 of the disciples meant well here. They all wanted to plan in terms of his kingdom and to serve that kingdom. James and John meant it when they said we're able. The lack of a reprimand reflects their sincere desire to be part of the kingdom, part of the action, to be put to work. Then the last incident here seems it comes, it comes a little later because it's after Jesus had uh, gotten to Jericho. And this is the healing of the blind man Bartimaeus. But Jesus had just spoken of true leadership was that of service. So the next thing we have is an example of Jesus serving. And it's also people telling, say, Jesus can't be bothered doing this. You see, Jesus said, my, job, my role here is one of service and of giving. And then a man asked him to give, and people are shushing him. See, Bartimaeus is named here in Mark. And he is the one that apparently spoke. Matthew says that there was another uh, blind man with him. Matthew and Mark both place this event event right after Christ's lesson on ministering to others. Luke places it right after his prediction of his death, which is also a form of service. So this is obviously an example of service. Again, we have crowds. And the crowds are shushing the blind beggar, crying out for mercy. It's a good picture of how the world elevates men. They wanted to elevate Jesus, so they tried to keep him from the people who needed him most. And they said, he's too important for a poor blind man. See, this, even though Jesus was famous as a miracle worker, the famous, you know, you're not important enough for one of his miracles. You know, don't ask him. Keep quiet. So the crowd tried to silence the beggars, but they cried out the more. And what they said was, Thou son of David, have mercy. Okay. That was a profession that Jesus was the Messiah. In many ways, the disciples didn't understand uh, what Jesus was saying, especially about his death and, and resurrection. The crowds were anxious to hear him. They wanted to see miracles. It's hard to really understand what was going on in, in the minds of all those people. But they didn't understand a great deal either. But here was a blind beggar asking Israel's Messiah for mercy. The crowd was wrong. The blind beggar was not an imposition of Jesus, but rather he serves as a representation of why Jesus came. I've said before that the miracles of Jesus really reveal the transforming power of his kingdom one that's still being worked out in history. Matthew notes that 
Jesus had compassion for them. Then he healed them and they followed him. Again, this is a statement of how, of how God's kingdom works. It's one of compassion and service. And the leadership is one of service and the people follow after the service. The disciples, try as they might, did not understand much of what Jesus said. The crowds were fascinated by him but had less understanding. Blind Bartimaeus likely understood even less, but at least he knew to cry out to Jesus in his need. He knew to cry out to Jesus as his only hope, as the Messiah. As Paul would later write, we see through a glass darkly. Probably refers to a mirror. And now mirrors are crystal clear, but back then they were somewhat cruder. A mirror always did ha distorted somewhat at the time. They weren't a perfect reflection. So we see a reflection of reality at best. And then our reflection of reality is distorted in many ways by sin. Like those of James and John, even our ideas of how we might serve the kingdom may be absurd, even if well-intended. But we can minister, we can serve, and we can give ourselves uh, to the service of the kingdom. And we do so by serving others. And the, the healing of Bartimaeus and the showing of mercy to Bartimaeus was an example of the leadership Jesus was talking about. And the future of the disciples in the coming months and years represented great hardship. It wasn't a centralized kingdom, it was a very decentralized one, and their, their futures were very difficult, and they were leaders of the 12 tribes, the Church of Israel, the new Israel of God, but they were often very difficult ones, but they did serve, and they were faithful to his kingdom. So James and John got what they asked, but in a very, very different way. And we, sometimes we're going to have very hard times, but we have to remember that we're here to serve. And the rewards and the glory are only guaranteed for us in eternity. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious Heavenly Father, make us desirous to serve your kingdom. And even when we don't know how, give us opportunity to serve and put the opportunities that we need in front of us. And we, we pray that you'd help us not to, to try to determine for ourselves how we will serve the kingdom, but help us to make them op most of the opportunities that are right in front of us. We uh, pray that we would not be in, in the category of those that would be uh, jealous of others' role in the kingdom. Help us not to be uh, one of those who are are keeping those uh, in need away from the miracle of your grace. We pray that you would encourage us and that we may that your spirit work in our lives so that we may be faithful to you and, and, and give us grace to in some small way further your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number six. Hymn number six. Hymn number six, this is my father's world. <clears throat> Let us stand and sing, uh, this is my father's world. <laughs>
go in peace. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you this day and to always. Amen. <laughs>